God is good. Amen? And then uh, before I get into the message, just, just branching off that, um, I think it's important in, in our life, in our Christian walk today, that we remain in faith. Regardless of how we feel, what we see, uh, whether God's answering our prayers right away or not, we have to stay in faith. Because the enemy wants to tear your faith down. And as far as I can read in Scripture, not just in one place, but in many places, God rewards the faithful. He rewards those that remain in a place of trust, trusting your life in His hands, trusting His timing, or your timing for whatever it is you're standing in faith for, in His hands. And here's something that a lot of people don't like to hear, especially on a Sunday morning. There are times there's delay because God's desiring to do something in your life that you're kicking and screaming and kicking against God. Is that too hard? Okay, because it's truthful. Paul was kicking against God, and God had to intervene because Paul had a call on his life, and he kept kicking and kept kicking and kept kicking, and you don't want to have a road to Damascus experience with God. You've already had that, right? When you came into a knowledge of Jesus Christ, you've had your road to Damascus experience. It's time to start standing in faith for the things that we're believing for. And it's time to ask people for prayer. Can, 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 I, can I just say this? It's okay if you're struggling with faith. Are you hearing me? It's okay if there's something going on in your life that you can't get victory in. But like Jordan said, you need to talk about it. Come on. You need to talk about it. Part of a church family and part of a church home is building community. And part of building community is understanding that everybody's in a different place. And part of building one another up in a different place is we've got to just be real and honest with one another. And if you're struggling, be honest about it. Because here's my motto, if somebody judges you for being honest, then tell me and I'll get Jordan to kick your butt, okay? Well, sometimes when people are being religious, you don't need to kick their butt nicely. Okay. But if he can't handle it, I'll take care of it, right? <laughs> Or we'll get Jack. The biker. No, you, Jack. Yes. This Jack right here. <laughs> but here's the thing. Part of, like Jordan was saying, part of what the enemy does is it gets us isolated, gets us away from people, and then we get stuck in bad thinking, bad faith, bad belief, bad trust. And slowly what the enemy does is he begins to undermine everything that's there in your foundation. And the next thing you know, you're, you're a wreck. Am I speaking to anybody today? Next thing you know, you're a wreck. And we can avoid that if we can just get to a place of being comfortable with where we're at honestly and say, I can't do this by myself. God put people in my life, in my church family, to be a part of a family to help mature us all up. I'm going to say something that's not very popular in today's secular Christian culture. God expects us to grow up. He expects us to grow up. He expects us to look more and more like Jesus every day. And sometimes when we're going through things, we don't look like Jesus. Are we okay with that? All right, I'll, that, that was a pre-encouragement before the message today. So uh, the message today is entitled Embedded. In, embedded, Embedded. M E M B E D D E D. Embedded. Am I saying that right? Okay, because you're looking at me like, he did it again. He mispronounced the word. Don't mispronounce the title of the message this morning. Okay. So let me real quickly give you a Cambridge dictionary uh, definition of embedded. Fixed firmly and deeply into a surrounding mass. Implanted. Get a picture of a diamond ring. 
gold ring that has diamonds implanted. Like, I have my original wedding ring. My wife is on her third one, but I have my original one. Sorry. <laughs> it's true. Please explain. She keeps losing them. <laughs> it's a good thing I can't be tossed away that easy, right? I don't slip off her finger that, that, yeah, okay. So anyways, so embedded, like diamonds in a ring. Um, so diamonds become part of that ring. Anybody here ever have a thorn? Okay. Thorns feel good, huh? Well, that gets embedded, usually your fingers, sometimes your eyeball, um, if you're Paul, in your side. Um, but thorns get embedded into us. It also means this. An emotion, opinion, etc., is embedded in someone or something. So we are emotional people, right? Because we have emotions. God's given us emotions. And sometimes those emotions, good or bad, are embedded in us, and we respond out of those emotions. Are you with me? Um, And so, depending on how strong they are in us, whether it be emotions or opinions, they end up coming out, right? Even though they're deep down opinions, etc. Okay? Um, Embedded also means existing or firmly attached within something or under a surface, okay? So, we're getting this idea that it's, it's in there. That definition gives you some idea that it can be deep or it can be at the surface, what happens if you have something uh, embedded close to the surface? It's easy to eject it, like a, a splinter that's not very deep in. You can get that out, okay? And how many of you remember this back, back from different wars and stuff like that, conflicts? The journalists that were embedded, I think I read 700 journalists were embedded in the different uh, campaigns when we're doing the Gulf Wars. And they were embedded in there, they looked just like the soldiers, but they were there and they were protected by the soldiers as they traveled everywhere um, that they went in that that group of people. Um, So let me ask you this. The Word of God, His Scripture, the Bible, is the Word of God embedded in your life? See, I like to ask questions. Because hopefully right there you... You had some, some quick thought of crud. Is he going there today? Is the word of God embedded into your life? Is it embedded at the surface? Or is it deeply embedded in you? Because right now what we need is we need a church to rise up that's going to have the word of God embedded deep into us, not shallow. Because shallow in today's world and what the enemy's doing in the world today isn't going to help us. We got to get whatever shallow thoughts we have, doctrine we have, theology we have, we got to get it bedded deep in us because that's what's going to survive any test that comes your way. That's what actually survives if you're standing for healing. That's what survives. Because it doesn't question God's goodness. It doesn't question God's sovereignty. It doesn't question, what the heck are you doing, God? It, it's just solid. God is my healer, and I'm standing on that till I die. So is the Word of God embedded in you? Is the Word of God implanted firmly and deeply in you like a diamond in a ring? I'm just going to bring these definitions into the Word of God. Does the Word of God affect your emotions and opinions? Does does the Word of God direct your emotions and opinions? Is the word of God strong in you and cannot be shaken out of you? Is the word of God firmly attached within you or just under the surface? Is the word of God embedded in you in such a way that when you come under attack, the word of God protects you? Can I say another thing that could be conceived as hard, but I believe we're empowered to do it? The word of God will change us, but we got to get it embedded. Some scriptures on the Word of God. Um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. This carries over from last week. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. 
Did you know that the word will do that? That the pastor doesn't have to do that? (laughs) Wow. And can I also say this? All scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our life. Do you know God wants to reveal to us what's wrong in our life? Do you, do you realize that? That is powerful. It reveals what's wrong in our life. It definitely shows us what's good. It shows us how, what God's ex- expectation is for us. But it also reveals what we need to change. Right? Like if you're here today and you harbor bitterness and unforgiveness, that needs to change. Scripture is very clear on that. Those are some of the hard things in Scripture where if you won't forgive, God says he won't forgive you. Wow, how do you want to live under that weight until you come to a place of forgiveness? That doesn't sound fun, does it? But God's good enough to reveal that to us in Scripture to say, hey, I want you to succeed in the way you succeed is to walk in forgiveness. Get rid of bitterness. Because if those things are still there, it's only going to hinder your ability to be all that I've called you to be. So it does show us what's wrong in our life. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us what to do, what, or teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. You think it's important to have the word of God embedded into us or at the surface? I think it's embedded in us. Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. And it is a discerner of thoughts and intents of your heart. How many thoughts have you had? Probably a lot. You may have had some already this morning. Maybe you're having one right now about me going, why are you picking on us? I'm not picking on you, the word of God is. But my heart is for myself and for this church is that we will be all that we're called to be and that the word of God would get embedded into us. And how many of you understand that there are times that we have thoughts that aren't God thoughts? Come on. We have thoughts that aren't aren't even in the same universe as God. Now I know that God's thoughts are very high, right? And his thoughts are not our thoughts. But as believers, we now have the mind of Christ, so the ability there is for the the ability is there for us to actually begin to gain a God mind. And to walk in a God mind. But to do that, we've got to have the word be able to go with our thoughts. No, that's wrong. That does not actually line up with Scripture. How about the intents of our heart? You know, thank God that. We've all had intense things in our hearts that we haven't acted on, right? Right? I mean, I'm still alive. That's proof of it, right? I'm sure my wife has had at least one thought in her life, oh, I just want to take you out, right? And she didn't act on it. Thank God she didn't act on it. Although I'm a light sleeper, maybe that might be out of fear. No, I'm joking. But sometimes the intents in our heart, whether acted on or not, aren't correct. And the Word of God helps us work through these things. Helps bring revelation to us on how to be more and more in the image of Christ. It says this in Romans 15, 4. It says, such things were written in Scripture long ago to teach us. And and the Scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. Come on, all scripture is written, and actually all scripture brings us hope. Can everybody say hope? It brings us hope, it brings us faith, it brings us trust, but sometimes we got to grow into those things. Baby Christians don't all of a sudden have this mountaintop faith 99.9% of the time. But God brings them through, even like John Bevere was saying, brings them through wilderness experiences to mature them and to build their faith and move them along, Right? And sometimes that faith as a a baby Christian is like this to someone who's been a Christian for 40 years. And, you know, those aren't the times to go, well, you shouldn't feel that way. Well, no, that's the way they feel. And they have one month under their belt. You've had 40 years. You should be further along, right? That's where we come along and go, hey, I remember when I was newly a Christian. 
I was going through this, and this is how God brought me to a place of maturity and a place of faith and believing Him in this situation. And it's the same for you. That's where the church helps grow one another up. Not go, you shouldn't feel that way. What's your problem? Well, I'm just a baby. I still poop and pee. Give me a break. I'm giving up on this church. I'm giving up on Christ if this is the way it's going to be. I didn't sign on for this. I wouldn't sign on it either. So what do you have embedded in you? God's word and his thinking or the world's thinking? The reason I bring this up is because, you know, if you haven't figured it out yet, I've been talking about false doctrine that creeps into the church. I've been talking about some other things concerning those things. But we live in a world that desires to assault the church. And the more we're in the world, which you spend more time out there than you do here, right? So you spend more time out there because you spend more, you're out in the world. And who you hang around with, sometimes not by choice, but maybe by job, maybe by activities that you do, who you hang out with and how they talk and speak, it has the ability to affect what you think. And if we don't filter that through the Word of God, we'll be easily swayed to thinking like the world thinks instead of thinking like God wants us to think. Sometimes we carry these Christian things in, in our mind that are like, we almost, we feel like it's scriptural, but it's really not. Like, how about an easy one? We're all familiar with this one. God helps those who help themselves. Right? How many have heard that? How many have said it? Okay. Do you know what? That is not one bit scriptural. But it sounds good, doesn't it? You know, if you live by this thought, God only helps those who help themselves, you know what you end up becoming? A religious person. Look at the Old Testament. They took a, 10 laws and they made it into 600 laws. And it was regimented. It was a list of do's and don'ts. Don't pick that stick up on the Sabbath. You'd be breaking the Sabbath. Well, I get tired of having it stick into my toe. I'm going to pick it up and throw it out of the way so it's not sticking my toe. Well, that would be against the Sabbath, right? So if we live by this concept of God only helps those who help themselves, we don't need God, really, because we can just make our own life. But God actually has a plan for each of us in here, right? He does, whether you want to believe it this morning or not. He has a plan for your life. And as a believer, that plan for your life is to look more and more like Christ. That's an easy one. But maybe what you do in this life is different from one another in this place. Wouldn't you want to be on the right plan? God's plan? Or would you want to be on the one that that goes, eh, I'll make my own way. And the truth is we can make our own way. But in the end, God has a plan. Wouldn't we want to be on that path? So the idea that God only helps those who help themselves is an implication of us doing, us striving, us living this life of of perfectionism that doesn't actually lead to freedom, it leads to our destruction. Because the truth is, and if you don't like this statement, who can you email? Richard, email Richard this week. If you don't like this statement, You're not perfect. You're not holier than thou. You haven't arrived before above Jesus. You're much further below Jesus. And we're all a work in progress. And God, or Satan would love to get you tied up in perfectionism. He'd love to get you tied up in a whole bunch of rules and regulation. Instead of living in the freedom that Christ paid for us to live in on the cross, allowing the word of God and the Holy Spirit to change us. And the only thing that you need to do is this, surrender. Surrender to the Word, surrender to the Holy Spirit, you'll get where God wants you to believe. Go. Is that okay? Thank you, those three people. Okay. So what other things do we have in in our mind and in our heart that aren't even biblical, but we treat it as biblical? How do we view the world? Do we view it like we should? 
through a, a, a Christian lens, a, a, a Word of God lens, or do we view it through a world lens? And this is becoming critically important today because there, let me, let me put it this way. I think we're in a time in America right now where God's drawing a line. And God is actually shifting even in his church. Bear with me. Those who just want to play church or those who want to serve God. There's a line in the sand. I believe what God's doing right now in, this, in, in America is I believe he's raising up pastors who are going to get back to the word of God, who are going to preach the word of God, but I believe as that happens, there's going to be a hunger that's going to come across America. We don't need any more self-help things going on in the church anymore. We need to get back to the Word of God because the Word of God is the only thing that brings liberty and freedom in our life. We got to get back to we got to get back to the Holy Spirit and working and allowing Him to deal in our life as He deals through the Word of God. Because the Holy Spirit's not going to tell you opposite of the Word of God. He's going to stay true to the Word of God always. But I believe there's a, a line being drawn in the sand, and God is calling the church higher in America right now. And I believe, just, I, I'm a simple guy, I have simple thoughts, I believe that God's doing something. Even in the midst of what we can see, even in the darkness that we think is rising up, God's bigger, God's stronger, His Word still will deliver the worst of the worst. He'll set them free. God will do it. But we got to come back to the Word and preach the Word. And not a whole bunch of other crap. Whoops, I said it. Don't judge me. A whole bunch of other crap. I said it again. Sorry. Just to attract a crowd. Are you okay? I said the C-R-A-P word. Okay. That's as bad as it gets. Are we, are we okay? Because most of this isn't even on my notes. So we're probably not going to get very far today. But that's okay. Um. We got to get back to the word. There's something that happens when the when the church preaches the word in such a way that it's encouraging, it's uplifting, and it's it it brings freedom. How many of you, without raising your hand, would say today, "There's area of my li- in my life that I know I need freedom from that I don't experience now." I would venture to say, across this side to this side, we all have something that we're not experiencing freedom in. But you're not going to get that freedom by me reading some secular book, trying to preach that and make it palatable to you. You're going to get it as I get into the Word, study the Word, and bring something that's going to be life-altering altering and life-changing to your life. And as the church does that from East Coast to West Coast, or East Coast to West Coast, or East Coast to West Coast, that's right, that's East, that's West, right? I believe there's going to be a hunger in the church that's going to come back. I believe lives are going to change, and I believe that the church is going to start making an impact in the darkness, because when you're not free, it's hard to make an impact in the darkness. But when you become free, it's easier to go out and love people the way Christ does, because you're not sitting there going, man, I'm such a hypocrite, I'm dealing with this in my life, and I'm trying to talk to them about this. Come on, am I speaking to anybody today? I think when the truth comes back into the word, uh, the truth of the word of God comes back into the church, I believe there's going to be a loosening of all this crud that people have been carrying around for all their life instead of walking in the freedom that the cross paid for us to walk in. I believe emotional healing will come. I believe that physical healings will come. I believe that our will will begin to line up with God's will because that's what the Word of God does. It divides the flesh from the spirit. It's sharp. It's detailed. God can get deep down into that little nook and cranny of your heart and he can go, I want to remove that. And with a fine scalpel, he can carve that out and bring freedom to your life. But all you have to do is just surrender and say, Lord, I know it's going to hurt, but I want freedom more than I, I care about the pain. I want to give up something that I know is not the best for me because I want all that you have for me. 
I don't want to settle anymore in a halfway Christianity. I don't want to settle for a half-delivered life. Lord, I want to settle for the fullness of what you paid for on the cross. And I want to be free. I want to be free. I want to be free. Am I speaking to anybody today? It's the Word of God that liberates. It's the Word of God that celebrates the old life becoming a new life. It's the old life that passes away. And I think far too long the church in America has stopped preaching the Word of God to the point where it changes people anymore. How often do we come in on a Sunday morning and never get challenged about anything and we walk out the same? I don't believe that's God's heart. I believe God wants His church to walk victoriously. Since Scripture does say you are more than conquerors for those who are in Christ Jesus. What mountain do you have before you? What thing do you have before you right now that's been driving you nuts? And you start up and you fall back down. You start up and you fall back down. Can I say this today? I don't care how big that thing is or how small that thing is or how deep that thing is. The blood of Jesus Christ paid to set you free. And it doesn't matter. Even, even the segue into the, the video about but what he was talking about, porn. And when we were discussing this, and I'm glad you brought it up, that porn is an addiction. And it is something that affects men by far. But if you don't know this, and I've preached on this before in the past, that the women in the world are now rising up in the percentage of, of them that are tied up into it. So what used to be a mainly a man thing is no longer a mainly man thing, it's a human thing. And it goes across male or female. But the course is so much deeper than that. Yes, it's titled porn, which you're right. Most people are going to go, whoa. But you know how many addictions there are out there in America right now? Come on. Let's just go through some of the top ones. Whether it's legal or not, it's an addiction. Pot. Doesn't matter that, the, that our state legalized it, it still puts you in another realm when you're on your high. And guess what? It's not a heavenly realm. Drinking. Oh, no comment there. I'm going to say it again. Drinking. And I'm going to say something that eh, some of my friends that don't go here might not like this. But I think we've justified drinking as taking the edge off our day, but it's every day. There might be an addiction there. And it might be that you're turning to another substance instead of turning to God. Too hard? Well, let me say it again. <laughs> Maybe something that you view as free license, the scripture says, don't be drunk with wine, right? Well, I'm not drunk. You might have a little buzz, though. Well, it's getting really quiet now. I don't know why. But maybe what we made license for is actually more of an addiction than we care to admit. How about prescription medication? Pain pills. Now, let me speak to this very carefully. Because I had a mother-in-law who was in extreme, extreme pain. And I get that. It's another thing to be in extreme pain, but it's another thing to get hooked on drugs, painkillers, while you're going through a recovery place, but not giving it up when you could. And then you keep taking, because listen, there's a high that comes with pain medication. And there's a time to get off of it when you don't need it anymore. But when we continue on, you're setting yourself up for an addiction. And this nation is riddled from coast to coast with people that are addicted to opiates. Which, by the way, if you don't realize, much of that is derived from cocaine. 
We're not shy on addictions in America. We're not shy. And if we have an addiction in America and you belong to a local church, I'm saying this is a safe place and I'm going to reiterate it to come out. Come on. It's a safe place to come out. Because God has victory for you. Listen, Scripture says, what remains in darkness remains in darkness. Right? And that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to keep you isolated. He wants to keep you separated. He, he wants you in darkness. Right? Because of fear, shame, guilt, condemnation, whatever the, the list can go on of the tools the enemy uses. But what you bring out of darkness into the light, victory's right around the corner. And that's a paraphrase. As long as it's in darkness, you'll remain in that darkness and that effect. But once you bring that out into the light, now there's freedom for you. Because you just broke condemnation, guilt, shame, and everything that's associated with that the enemy used to keep you there. And you know what? It's hard to do. But it's the most liberating thing you can do. Okay, well, today we're supposed to get into First Psalms. We're going to go through the first Psalms this week, but maybe we won't. How about this? Can I just take a couple extra minutes? Because this, this is going off. Can I go off the reservation today? Just a I just want to read a scripture. Hebrews 11. Chapter. That means I'm going to need these. Do my eyes look big? Chapter 11, verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot ate Rahab, did not perish with those who did, who, who, with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For the time would fall, fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Josephat, or not Josephat, Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of the weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourging, yes, and of chains and, and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sodded too, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. Think about that. All these people just mentioned, and one's not mentioned, received a promise because of the faith. They had a good testimony of faith. And so maybe you haven't been sawn in two. Maybe you haven't been eaten by a lion. Maybe you haven't had these things done to you, but maybe your battle is just as bad. By standing in faith, your deliverance is coming. By standing and trusting God in whatever your issue is, whatever your battle is, whatever that addiction is, whatever uh, the Word of God that needs to get planted deeper, whatever it is, by faith we obtain. By faith, everybody say, by faith we attain. No matter how bad it gets, no matter what things look like, no matter what doctor report comes back, we obtain by staying in faith and believing God at His Word. And in the end, those didn't receive the promise. You know what the promise was? Jesus. 
We're on the other side of Jesus now. It's all been paid for. It's all in the past. We just have to come in line with Jesus. We got to not just come and say a prayer, but we got to get enraptured with a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that liberates us, getting that word deep down inside us and allowing the Holy Spirit to do the work that he's there in us to do. God is so good, church. And guess what? He's patient. He's patient. While we're going through things, and some might be sitting there today right now thinking, well, you know, I've got this thing going on. I don't know if I want to bring it to the light. Can I just say, that's the enemy talking. But can I just say this? He's patient with you while the Holy Spirit's trying to work in you. And he's loving, he's gracious, he's merciful as we delay the fullness of what God wants us to walk in. Don't get me wrong. I think he wants us there faster than we get there. But he's loving, he's gracious, and he's merciful, and his hands are always open wide, saying, come to me, and I'll give you rest. How many need rest today? Come on. I think we all need some form of rest. Well, you don't get rest by striving, by perfectionism. You don't get rest by doing, 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 doing. There's a time that we've got to wait. And take the stance or the, the, the position of waiting on the Lord to do what he does best. And that's to liberate not just the church, but the world outside the church.